Hello and welcome to this third little movie clip about the ancient Greek culture. We're today talking about Distinctive Characteristic 5, which is all about the classical shaping, architecture, sculpture, and all of the culture of the Greeks and Romans. And today we're focusing, of course, on the Greeks. Here you see a few examples, specifically for theater, but also of the famous golden rectangle, the sort of uh, proportions that the Greeks used to build their famous arches and buildings with and uh, this golden section is, has become very famous uh, has been used all over um, and is also very uh, lots of mathematical uses so this classical greek uh, greek shaping um, the greeks and the romans in dutch the classical formatal from the greek romans culture Today we're focusing on religion philosophy and the arts and specifically on the golden age of athens which starts around 479 BC after the Persian Wars and lasts up about until 431 BC when the war starts with the Spartans, which is actually not that long. And it's an age in which all sort of famous inventions, philosophers, all uh, major things that we have actually copied from the Greeks um, have been invented or have been established. Well, one of the things that's interesting is that during this period, Athens grew very rich, which was mostly due to trade uh, all across the Mediterranean and from the silver mines in uh, a place called Laureon. Um, and those two things combined led to uh, Athens having lots of wealth in this period. And uh, one man is mentioned in this book, uh, well, one politician, I have to say, Pericles, and he was a very powerful man. So he was a general. Uh, during the uh, Peloponnesian War against Sparta. Um, but he uh, was also famous for his one of the orations he had, a funeral oration, uh, in which he very much defended democracy. So this has become very famous. Um, he says democracy is a far superior system um, to aristocracy or to, the, to those barbarian Spartans. Um, but he also started the construction of the Parthenon, uh, one of the most famous remains, of course, of, um, of Athens nowadays. Um, which was a temple for uh, Pallas Athena, uh, the goddess of Athens, for obvious reasons. So when we look at the ancient Greek religious beliefs, so we're focusing on the era before um, and actually during the time when the Greeks made their sort of uh, rational revolution and started thinking for themselves. Um, we know the Greeks for, for two things. Uh, one, for their system of polytheism, which with all these different sets of gods and goddesses um, and for their uh, sort of start with rational scientific thinking which we'll get back on a little a bit later so this family of gods uh, they were called the olympians and um, they were believed to be immortal of course because well what decent god is not immortal but um, they would also act like people so they were very human-like um, and they would have all sorts of human emotions such as jealousy and anger, love, fear, hate and so on. Um, and very often these Greek gods would uh, also have children with mortals, specifically Zeus, the, the, the main god, uh, had sort of a habit of um, um, trying to, uh, well, um, uh, woo women and then have uh, children with them. So they had lots of uh, demigods such as Heracles, a very famous uh, Greek mythic hero. And the Greek religion, religion was all about enjoying life on earth as well. So there was an underworld, we'll get back to that, um, but it was all about um, having a good time on earth um, and having the best time that you could have while you were here. And they could also interfere directly with the people. So um, they could just come down and, uh, for example, have an effect on a war. Um, Pallas Athena was believed to uh, have been influencing the Trojan War um, and, for example, um, um, protecting uh, Odysseus, for example, when he came back from the Trojan War. Uh, and on the other hand, Poseidon was believed to uh, be against uh, Odysseus when he came back. All sorts of examples of the Greek gods actually being there and interfering in people's lives. And one important thing, um, people believed that so you could also contact the gods and the oracle would be a place to do that in. Uh, it would be a place where you could answer questions to the gods and then they would be sort of answered as well. You could, you could ask a question, they would be answered, but this would be very often in a very strange way, which 
if you not pay attention, could very well uh, turn against you um, if you did not follow, or actually did follow what the oracle would say. So, here's a picture of the 12 Olympians. Um, you don't have to remember all of them, by the way, but just so that you have seen them for once. Um, Zeus was the ruler of all gods, Hera was his wife, uh, and they had lots of children. Um, they did not, not just uh, come up out of thin air because they um, were sons and daughters themselves of the Titans. But these are the 12 Olympians that were the main gods um, of uh, the Greek system. But they had lots and lots more. So there were demigods, um, local gods. You could have a, a god for your home. So uh, one of the gods that actually is not mentioned here is Hestia, which left the Olympus. Was, uh, that was sort of the story. But you see all sorts of gods here for war, for love, the messenger, uh, the god of the wine, engineering and fire, hunting. And they had gods for everything. And one is interesting uh, to, to mention separately, that's Hades, because he was not an Olympian god because he lived in the underworld. The Greek, of course, had a very clear dualistic view of the world. Uh, you would have a life on earth, but uh, in the end you would go to the underworld. Uh, you would uh, sail across the river Styx, and then uh, you would be there for eternity. So, um, well, you'd best uh, spend your life well and be in the good book with Hades, or else it would be not such a nice time in the underworld. So this is one of the things that we know the Greeks very well for, this sort of view of uh, the gods and um, this very polytheistic system. Well, when we look at the dramatic arts, you see that the Greeks um, sort of based their design on their buildings on a figure called the golden rectangle. Here you see it. So this was a sort of a rectangle which had proportions which were considered to be ideal. So um, the general idea is that... Uh, AB, so the, the portion of AB has a sort of a dimension to BC, similar as, uh, um, let's see here, uh, uh, I have to be very specific here, uh, EF would be to EC, so there would be all sorts of proportions, which would also lead to a spiral which could be uh, reproduced into infinity. Um, and they would use this, so when they were building the Parthenon and the temples, they would sort of used these proportions because they thought it, this would be sort of a mathematical beauty. The most magnificent work again was the Parthenon, which was used for this uh, explaining of their culture. And the interesting thing is that the sculptors here, and we'll get back to that as well, were very dramatic and realistic, full of action, lifelike, uh, accurate. So they pay lots and lots of uh, attention to detail showing the Greek uh, people and, uh, in the way that they actually were, uh, spending a lot of time, for example, on these horses that were on the triglyph of the Parthenon. So, um, that was sort of the mythical part, and, well, it says copy this note. I really urge you to take short note of this, because it's actually a sh complete summary for everything that's being uh, taught about the Greek. From mythical to critical, these are the two things that we know the Greeks very well for. The mythical side, which I just explained a little bit about, and the critical side. So those two things are very important when it comes to this distinctive characteristic. Till around 600 BC, um, the gods were considered to be conscious actors, I already mentioned that, influencing people's lives, and they used these epic stories and myths to explain the world around, uh, around them. So the Greeks would sort of not understand thunder, and then they sort of thought of thought up the story that uh, Zeus would be angry and throw his lightning balls through the sky uh, and that's just one example all sorts of myths and stories were created to explain the world around them and this is also the time uh, from uh, the famous stories of Homer the Iliad and the Odyssey I mentioned them earlier um, this is the time that uh, all these stories were made and till 600 BC so that's also the time of the uh, the city-states the polis the community was considered to be more important than the individual, so you would be part of your family or of your polis and so on. However, you already feel it coming, around 500 BC-ish, you see that there's a huge change in thinking, and I can't stress this enough, this is a really important uh, thing to understand. Um, people start to use their own reasoning and critical skills. So one of the reasons for that was um, also the entering of the democracy a little bit. People had to start thinking for themselves, explain themselves, um, have skills in debate and uh, um, having a good speech, for example. So people would be trained in how to come up with good ideas and so on. 
And um, they would use these skills to come to reasonable conclusions. And I'm going to give you a few examples of, of philosophers, inventors, thinkers who did this. So a very famous example in medicine is Hippocrates, who started um, researching and, uh, uh, medicine and looking into the human body and see how it worked and try to improve it and come up with a medicine for certain illnesses instead of just uh, praying to the gods. In mathematics, we know Archimedes and Pythagoras, you might have no known these from uh, actually your mathematical lessons. Um, they came up with theories, and specifically proportional theories, that we still use today, that were used to construct buildings, but used for all sorts of calculations. In history, uh, you could say that Herodotus and Thucydides were the first, maybe, modern historians that would not just tell stories to entertain people, um, uh, or to explain certain things that were that were, was uh, used myth, myths for, um, but they would tell stories to remember them and to um, incorporate all sides. So, for example, Herodotus starts his story about the Persian Wars by saying uh, there's different sides to the story. This is the Persian side, this is the Greek side. I'll uh, use both and then see what is true. So this is actually the start of proper science, as you might uh, call it. So so seeing things from different sides. Here you have them both. And in philosophy, um, well, there's lots of uh, philosophers, and there's also, if you take philosophy as a subject, you know that there's other so uh, philosophers before these three, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, but these are seen as the most famous ancient Greek Athenian philosophers because uh, well, they really turned uh, thinking around in this time. So you need to be able to give a few examples of this critical thinking. And you might have noticed that the distinctive characteristic has changed as well, because um, this is about critical thinking and development of scientific thinking, of course. So a bit more about those uh, three guys. Socrates was very uh, famous for questioning everything. So he would ask difficult questions to people on the street about what they were doing, or to the people in power. Uh, also, well, not only to confuse them, but also to have them think about what their knowledge was based on. So, know thyself was his, for, his most important sort of um, motto, so to say. And he also said, I know nothing of myself, but I know that I know nothing, and that kind of helps. Uh, in the end, he was forced to uh, take the poison cup and uh, kill himself, because uh, Athens saw him as a burden. His student, Plato, um, was uh, studying the meaning of uh, big issues, big things, for example, friendship and justice and love and uh, what is behind that. Uh, and he also just, uh, sort of researched how society can best be governed. So he said, in the end, society should be divided into three groups, the workers, the soldiers, and the rulers, who should be philosophers, which is not entirely a coincidence. And finally, Aristotle, um, he was not so much fascinated by what is true and beautiful, but he was fascinated by the senses. So he said, I'm going to categorize everything I know and see. Um, one of the first European biologists, so to say, and he uh, was very much about precise observation, wrote lots and lots of books about um, all the things that he could see, find, and so on. So three philosophers who all added to what is critical thinking, um, in this case, about a uh, very different range of topics, but all added to what critical thinking can be. Well, from mythical to critical, yet again, um, during the 5th century, we also see that um, a whole new view on man starts emerging. So it's not about being a community, it's about being an individual. Uh, you need to become more important and the concepts are raised to classical standards. You have to excel in what you do. So sculptors would make want to make the best paintings. Architectures would make the best and be most beautiful buildings, such as the Parthenon, using all different sorts of columns, which they've copied from the Egyptians. And the sculptors would very much pay attention to perfect human bodies. So look at how a body is positioned and um, look at the exact um, way that a, a body is standing if you want to sculpt it. And also in theatre, people would make theatres like this um, and uh, uh, of course do the plays and the plays would be more like the mythical style, but uh, arrange them and uh, use architecture to make them perfect. That was it for today. I hope you learned a lot about classical shaping and see you next time.